60 years and two days ago, five young men between the ages of 27 and 32 were speared to death by Huarani warriors in eastern Ecuador. They were there with their wives and family for the purpose of trying to bring the gospel to this murderous, treacherous, bloodthirsty tribe that was unreached and who had never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Three days after they were murdered, before anyone knew for sure that they were dead, a bush pilot was flying over looking for them, trying to figure out what had happened, and he radioed back to the widows who were sitting by short waves that he had found bodies strewn along a little tributary of the Amazon that were the bodies of their husbands. One of those widows was Elizabeth Elliot. And she tells about sitting by the shortwave, waiting word on her husband. And when it became obvious that he and the others were missing, and during those three days when they weren't sure if indeed they were dead, her mind began to be filled with fear. What would she do? Having an infant child in a country that she was largely unfamiliar with if her husband was taken from her. And there was a passage of Scripture that came to her mind that she clung to together with the other widows as they encouraged one another. That verse was Isaiah chapter 43. The first couple of verses of that wonderful chapter of comfort which says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. A year later, an article that she wrote was published in the magazine Christianity Today that was just then beginning publication. And Elizabeth Elliot wrote in behalf of all five of the widows about what life had become for them in the wake of the murder of their husbands. This is what she wrote. Having referred to Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, she said, how could we have proved the truth of that promise if there had been no waters? And what rivers could overflow but deep ones? And so to show us that He meant what He said, to prove to us in His love, this is what He sent. This thing which each of us had been sure she could never endure. The loss of the one who was as her own soul. And until her death last summer, Elizabeth Elliot continued to teach, continued to write, continued to encourage others with the hope that comes from God's Word and knowing that indeed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, God is a God of comfort. He is a God who keeps His promises to His people. He is a God who will never leave, never forsake those whom by the blood of His own Son, He has redeemed. God indeed is a God of comfort. We've sung that this morning. We've heard it from His Word. And we're going to look at it more intently in the portion of God's Word that we are now studying. We are in our second study of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in the New Testament, the letter that is known to us as 2 Corinthians. And our text this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 all the way down through verse 7. If you're using one of the Bibles that's provided for you. It's found on page 964. I encourage you to take a copy of God's Word, open it up, turn it on, so that you can follow along with our study this morning. Hear God's Word from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, down through verse 7. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we shall share abundantly in comfort too. 
If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaking, unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. The God of comfort always comforts all of His people in all of our afflictions. This is the promise of His Word. This is what the Apostle Paul had experienced, who as he explains later in 2 Corinthians, had lived through almost unspeakable trials and afflictions. The obvious theme of this paragraph I've just read is comfort. Paul uses the word comfort in its noun or verb form ten times in these five verses. And in doing so, he's actually signaling one of the overarching themes of this whole letter that he has sent to the church at Corinth. A theme that in our human weakness, God manifests His power. That our human weakness is actually not a barrier to God's power and comfort. It's a receptacle that God builds into us so that we can come to know His grace and power that He provides in Jesus. Or as we are thinking about in embarking upon this study, that God's power in the Gospel is made manifest in our human weakness. Well, what does Paul mean by comfort? It's important for us to get this straight and be clear on it because often the way that we use comfort in our day today is significantly different from the meaning that it had in the Bible. We speak of creature comforts and wanting to be comfortable. We speak of comfort in terms of ease. We're comfortable if it's not too hot or not too cold or not too hard not too difficult. And so we talk about a comfortable lifestyle where we have an adequate resource of income, financial resources to sustain us and keep us in comfort. Well, that's not precisely what the word comfort meant in the New Testament. In fact, it's not even precisely what the word comfort meant in Old English. One writer comparing to the way we think of comfort today to the way it was thought of in old English times, says the word comfort has gone soft in modern English. Because in old English, it had a closer connection to its Latin roots. The root word fortis, which means brave, strong, courageous. With the prefix cum, which means together with or alongside. And so in Old English, much closer to the New Testament meaning, this idea of coming alongside someone to help them be strong. To help them know courage. It's very much what the word means that the Apostle Paul uses here. He speaks of comfort as that which is brought alongside a person who is in distress so that he might be encouraged to persevere, to stand firm, to not be knocked off course. In our text, Paul uses this word to describe the character of God as well as the work that God undertakes in behalf of His people. And in order for us to understand what Paul means in this chapter, this paragraph on comfort, I want to ask three questions of the verses we just read. Questions that these verses answer. The first is this. Who is this God of comfort. Well, you'll see in verse three, verse 3 that when Paul praises him, he identifies him with three specific phrases. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. When Paul starts this uh, description of God in this way, he's actually borrowing from one of 19 Jewish synagogue benedictions. And he's taking that benediction and he's Christianizing it by not saying, blessed be the God and Father of Israel, which was common in the synagogue, 
but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's showing that the God who is worthy of blessing, the God who is comfort, who provides comfort, is the God and Father who has revealed His Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. So that first phrase, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are theologically oriented, a question may have popped into your mind. How can God be both Father and God of Jesus Christ? And that's a question that those today who are unwilling to believe that Jesus is God in flesh Himself have for us as well. But the Scripture teaches us that as the eternal Son of God, Jesus relates to God in His trinitarian trinitarian relationship as Father. He's the eternal Son of the eternal Father. And so we see this when He walked the earth as He repeatedly referred to God as His Father more than a hundred times in the Gospels. He regularly prayed to God as His Father. But also as a real man, Jesus relates to the Lord as God. And so in His humanity as the incarnate One, He sees God not only as His Father, but as the one true God. This is why on the cross, <coughs> as He was suffering, He cries out in His humanity, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? Because Jesus has reconciled us to God, and everything that Paul says about God, and all that God is for us, is true because of Jesus Christ. Everything Paul wants us to know about God is true because of Christ. Everything that comes to us from God comes to us in Christ. So abstract thoughts about God are a generic deity out there somewhere. I believe in God. I believe in something out there that's a a great power greater than anything else. Those thoughts while they might be a starting point, are woefully inadequate to come to know this God whom Paul is celebrating in this benediction, in this doxology, who he's commending to this church full of people who are afflicted, who have needs to be comforted. If you want to know the true God, you must know Him in Christ. If you want to come to know the God of all comfort, you will not find Him apart from Christ. You want to grow in the grace and knowledge of the real God? You must grow in Christ. Because it is what God is. He is what He is for us in Christ. And what God is for us is what provides salvation and hope, and life. This is what Paul understands, and so it's what he commends even in his expression of praise to God before he begins to explain what God does. Now where did Paul get his understanding of God? He wasn't raised that way. He got this understanding of God from Jesus Christ Himself, who after His resurrection appeared to Mary as it's recorded in John chapter 20, verse 17. And he said to Mary, I am going to my God and your God. My Father and your Father. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became flesh, real man, relates to God as Father and God. So Paul wants to make certain that we understand what he's about to say is not true of just some generic identity of God. It's not true of various religions' conceptions of God. It is true about the only God there is. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to identify God as the Father of mercies. Mercy. Mercy always has in mind relief. Relief of a sorrow or misery. Do you remember those blind beggars in Matthew 20 when they heard Jesus was passing by? They wanted to get their sight back. So they begged Him, have mercy. Have mercy. They were in distress. They wanted the distress relieved. 
and they knew what they needed was mercy. We read in the birth accounts of Jesus in Luke chapter 1 when the angel appeared to Zechariah and told him that his wife Elizabeth was going to conceive in her old age and bring forth a son who would be the forerunner of the Messiah. The people rejoiced at that news. They said that God had shown Elizabeth great mercy. Mercy. The relief of pain. The relief of distress. Paul here says that God is the Father. The source of mercy. He says He's the Father of mercies. Plural. Not just mercy in its general sense, but specific mercies. So any mercy that you've ever experienced in your life is the offspring of God. It's come to you by this God whom Paul is worshiping and celebrating and commending to the church here at Corinth. Every removal of misery and sorrow this world has known is from God. Every pain relief comes from God. Medicine, doctors, therapies, these are instruments of relief, but God is the source. Every experience of mercy you or I have ever received has come from the hand of God. And yet, how often are we guilty of not recognizing that? And we look only at the instrument and not the source. And so we talk about the instrument that has brought us mercy, not the one who himself has used the instrument to get it to us. I mean, how foolish would it be if you were to receive by a special courier, a special messenger tomorrow, knocking on your door with an envelope that you open and you find here is a million dollar check that you have received from some long lost relative. How foolish would it be if you went around and began to tell people, man, that messenger was so great. That courier was great. UPS is the best in the world. It'd be silly, wouldn't it? You would think, well, I didn't know I had this relative. He's, he's something. Why would he do this for me? You would want to extol the source of that financial relief. Friends, we need to guard carefully not to mistake the real source of all mercies that we have been shown in our life. Our mercies have come from God. He's the Father of mercies. And there's some of us in this room who have been receiving mercy from God for decades. Some of you have never acknowledged the source. Some of you will talk about great surgeons, great employers, great relatives, great friends that have been used in your life to relieve affliction and you have not stopped to consider that God is the one who sent them. God is the one who is the source and who has used them of the mercy that was administered to you. So today, if you've never done it before, acknowledge that your life, all of our lives, are because of the mercy of God. We are here breathing today by His mercy. And some of us have experienced incredible outpourings of His mercies over the course of our lives. Well, Paul says He's not only the Father of mercies, but He goes on and calls Him then this, this all-embracing title of the God of all comfort. He's the source of comfort, and He's the source of all possible comfort that lasts. As the source of all comfort, the Lord knows just how to supply it according to our needs. All kinds of comfort is stored up in God. How often do we need comfort in this world? The pressures, the trials, the stresses, the disappointments, the pains, the sorrows that come to us. and We just want comfort. And yet what's the default response for so many of us? We look for comfort almost anywhere but God. You can get comfort for a while from a bottle. Some of you know what that is? 
You could have the immediate relief that your soul thinks it longs for and it feels like, oh, finally I can at least be free from this terror by just drowning your sorrows. Or going to, to some kind of medication or drug that you think this will anesthetize me enough that at least I won't have to feel what I've been feeling. Or maybe it's, it's not booze or drugs for you. Maybe it's sex. Pornography. Something that will give you a little temporary relief because you feel the pressures, you feel the weight and the pain and you can't endure it and you need comfort. So you look for comfort and you click. You go and you, you find that which will give you temporary relief. Might be food. Something as good and valuable as food. I mean, we even talk about it, right? Comfort foods, right? And we can look to food to give us comfort because we know we need comfort. And brothers, sisters, friends, what we need to remember today is that God is the God of all comfort. He is able to supply comfort that lasts. Comfort that heals. Comfort that renews. Comfort that changes us and strengthens us. There are a thousand avenues that we can run down in hopes of finding relief or comfort, encouragement in any source other than God. Yet Paul says, God is the source of all comfort. If we want true help, we want lasting comfort, then we need to fight to see and believe what Paul is talking about here when he refers to our God as the source of comfort. Because God is for us in Christ and the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, He is worthy of being praised. And that's what Paul does here. Blessed be this God. It's an expression of praise. He's not adding blessing to God. He is acknowledging the blessedness that God is and has inherently. Well, not only does our text tell us who the God of all comfort is, it tells us what this God of comfort does. What does the God of comfort do? If you look at verse 4, Paul says it quite simply. <coughs> he comforts us in all our afflictions. As soon as Paul refers to God as the God of all comfort, he immediately describes his active involvement in bringing comfort to his people. Paul wants to reassure these Corinthians, these Christians in Corinth, that God comes alongside His people to encourage them, to stand with them, to help them, to strengthen them as they undergo trials and struggles. It's not only true that He's the God of all comfort, He is the God who actively gives comfort to us. Now when Paul says this, there are two things that we need to back up and not just skate over. We need to stop and recognize, okay, then these things must be true. When Paul says that the God of all comfort comforts His people, what does that mean? It means that we stand in need of comfort. He comforts us in our afflictions. What does that mean? It means we have afflictions. Christians aren't immune to afflictions, to trials in the world. Paul simply assumes this, rightly so. Scripture elsewhere very specifically tells us to expect afflictions. I mean, it says it so often, sometimes I'm just amazed at myself that whenever I find myself in an affliction, I think, man, what's going on? Why this? It's as if I've forgotten everything that the Bible says about how afflictions must come. Well, listen to what Jesus says in John 16, 33. The night before He was arrested to be executed the next day, He told His disciples, in this world, you will have tribulation. That's a promise. It's a promise. And yet, when tribulation comes, what are we tempted to do? To think, oh gosh, I can't believe this. Where's God? Doesn't He love me? What have I done? Why is this happening to me? Jesus said, it's going to happen in this world. Peter is even more stark 
following the teaching of Jesus in 1 Peter 4.12, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. What is he saying? He's saying afflictions in this world are not strange. They're not unusual. They're not to be unexpected. We should expect to experience afflictions. Certainly, that's true in light of what Paul is saying here. But secondly, Christians should expect God to comfort us in our afflictions. Who comforts us, Paul says, in all our affliction. That word that he uses for affliction is a very graphic word. It literally means to crush. One time when Jesus was in the midst of crowds in the Mark's Gospel, he says, you know, the crowds are about to crush me. And he was speaking literally that they were just caving in on him. Usually the word is used figuratively as Paul is doing here to speak of troubles that are imposed upon us from outside. When you're mistreated. When you are betrayed. When you're abused. When sickness comes to you. You can experience this kind of pressure that just feels like you're going to be crushed under it. But it is also used to describe those trials that arise from within ourselves. Those doubts, fears, discouragements, sorrows, disappointments that can loom so large that you sometimes think there's no way out. Paul says that God, the God of all comfort, comforts us in all our affliction. And He does so all of the time. There's never a time when God does not provide comfort for His people. You know, you think about this a minute. Who's Paul writing to? If anybody had reason to doubt God's willingness and to determine and determination to provide comfort for His people. It was these Christians at the church at Corinth. I mean, this was a group of believers who had all kinds of problems. Read 1 Corinthians, and you see some of the specific sins that Paul addressed that were going on in the congregation. Sexual immorality, incest, drunkenness, divisiveness, Legal maneuvers against one another. Profaning the Lord's table. And then we learn from 2 Corinthians that these were people who had provoked from Paul a painful visit. After he planted the church and he went to Ephesus, he had to go back for a brief visit because of so much corruption and sin in the church and it was painful for him to be there. And 2 Corinthians 2, he talks about a severe letter that he had to write to them because of all their sin. They're following after false apostles. They're beginning to deny the teaching of the very apostle who planted the church there. They're denying. They're walking away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And So I think if you're part of that church, Paul talks about the God of all comfort who supplies comfort for all of the afflictions of His people. It's not hard to imagine that they might think, yeah, maybe for others. But probably not for me. And yet Paul specifically reassures them of his confidence that God has comfort to supply them with all of their brokenness, with all of their failures, with all their shortcomings. Look at verse 7. It's amazing that Paul could say this about that church. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Brothers and sisters, have you sometimes feared that maybe you have sinned away any possibility of being helped by God anymore? Have you ever come to that point in your life where you you think, you know, I've just blown it. I, I've just stepped over the line and there's no more grace for me. There's no more mercy for me. There, 
There can't be any comfort for me the way that Paul is talking about God being the God of all comfort who comforts his people in all of our afflictions. That can't be for me. These Corinthians were guilty of some atrocious sins. And yet, we learn from 2 Corinthians 2 and 2 Corinthians 7, when Paul wrote a severe letter to them to call them to account for their sins and call them to repent, that many of them did repent. Which is exactly what Christians do. We repent of sin. We don't wallow in it. We don't think that we've somehow sinned away God's grace. We own sin and we return to the cross and we remember Jesus died for sin and we declare war upon sin. And that's what many in the church at Corinth did. And Paul, having received back from Titus now when he met him in Macedonia, the word of how that letter had impacted them, he's filled with encouragement and hope himself. And he says, oh, brothers, I'm confident that you share in this comfort, just as you share in our afflictions. Because Paul was confident that yes, though fallen, though weak, though backwards at many points, they were trusting Jesus Christ. Therefore, he could be confident with an unshaken hope that they will also share in the comfort God provides to all his people. So are you a child of God? I'm not asking are you a creature? Person, you know, well, God's our Father, right, of everybody. No, I'm not talking about that. Are you a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ? Is Christ your Lord? Have you bowed to Christ and said, You're God? Here are the keys of my life. You you take over. I trust you. I need you. My sin is more than I can bear. I need you to bear my sin. I need the forgiveness that you secured on the cross to cover me. I need righteousness that you secured in your obedient life to be credited to me. Have you come to Christ in that way? If so, brother, sister, believe that God who gives comfort in all of our afflictions will give comfort to you in your affliction. He will. It's the promise of His Word. It's who He is. It's not dependent upon you. God's a God of grace and mercy and comfort. And there's more grace and mercy and comfort in God than there is sin in you. You have to believe it. And declare war on your sin. Don't sign a peace tree with it. Don't think that somehow it's okay because God's so gracious. No, hate your sin, but look to the God of grace and come back to Him again. And believe and take Him at His word. And find the comfort that He has for His people. If you've not trusted Christ as your Lord, then this incredible depiction that Paul gives us here about the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies who comforts us in all of our affliction, you can't have it outside of Christ. And you must come to Christ. I mean, don't you want this? Who would want to go through the world day after day, year after year, decade after decade, without what Paul here describes God providing for His people. Friend, you don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to do something. Just trust Jesus. Believe the good news of salvation in Christ. Come to Christ Jesus as Lord. By faith, where you are right now, just call upon Him as Lord and bow to Him. Own Him as Lord. And you will find that He accepts you. And all that Paul here is writing becomes true for you. He's the Father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. He gives comfort to His children. And He does it in and through Christ, Paul says in verse 5, abundantly. Abundantly. Do you see that? Look at the language there again. As we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Sometimes Christians share in Christ's sufferings because we're obedient to Christ when it costs us. We're obedient to Christ and that obedience results in animosity, opposition, persecution. That can happen to an employee when 
his employer says, look, I need you to do this. That's immoral. And he says, I'm, I'm working for someone higher than you. And my Lord and my Master tells me to live according to what is right. And I can't do that. The employer says, well, if you don't do it, your job's gone. And despite all of your efforts, you have your job taken away from you because of your devotion to Christ. Or a student can have a professor, can have a teacher who says, you, you have got to write a paper that denies the reality, the historicity of Jesus Christ. That's your starting point. You just have to do that. You have to write and say that Jesus Christ is a myth. Students, I can't do this. Jesus Christ is no myth. Well, if you don't do this, you get an F on the paper. And despite all the efforts, the student says, well, I'm going to have to take the F then because my loyalties go beyond this classroom to one who has purchased me. Sometimes afflictions come to Christians. We share in the sufferings of Christ because we are suffering for Christ in this world. But most of the time, it's not suffering for Christ, it's suffering in Christ simply because we're in a broken world. We're in a world that's not the way it's supposed to be. And cancer comes. Death comes. Tornadoes come. Things that we have no control over, but the world is broken and we're part of it. And through faith in Jesus Christ, we live through those afflictions in Christ. We're in union with Christ. And what the Scripture teaches us is that because of the relationship that we as the people of God have with Jesus Christ, He is our head. We are His body. And what we experience, we experience in Him and He experiences. Think about this, brothers and sisters. Our sufferings, our afflictions are taken upon Himself by Jesus. This is exactly why in Acts chapter 9 we have the account of Paul who was on his way, as known as Saul, to murder Christians is arrested by the risen Christ. The risen Christ appears to him. And Paul is persecuting Christians. And you remember what Jesus said to him? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Me. Because what happens to his people is taken up into our Lord Himself. So Paul says it again in verse 5, as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. As Christ in union with us has taken our sorrows, our brokenness, our afflictions upon Himself, so the comforts that Christ has secured are ours abundantly as well. Christians share in the comfort that comes through Him because in Christ we've been reconciled to God. In Christ, God has become our Heavenly Father. In Christ, all the promises of God have been secured for us. In Christ, God is for us and will never leave us. He'll never withhold any good thing from us that we need because He who did not spare His own Son but delivered Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? He's our God. We're His people. He's purchased us. The comfort that God gives, He gives to those who are in Christ. And He gives through all that Christ is and all that Christ has done for us. God is our God. He has taken our side. He's brought us to His side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Do you know that God is for you? Are you sure of that? You can be. You can be sure of it by knowing that you are in Christ. And you get in Christ by faith. Trusting Him. Bowing to Him. If you've not bowed to Christ so that you've been united to Him by faith, today, today I invite you to come to Christ. So that you might know this God, God of comfort, Father of mercies, as your God. But our text tells us not only who this God is and what this God has done, but He also tells us why He does it. Do you see this in verse 4, the end of it? 
He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Do you see what Paul's saying? Why does God comfort us? So that we might provide comfort to others. What Paul's saying is that the comfort that God gives us in this broken world with our afflictions is not exclusively for us. It is for us, but it's also for others. Divine comfort makes us stewards in this world. It makes us responsible to seek the comfort of others so that we can comfort them with the very comfort that we've received from God. The comfort that God has for us in Jesus is often delivered to us through personal ministry. It often comes to us through other people. Things they do. Examples they set. Words they speak. Prayers that they pray. But it always comes from God. This is one reason the Christian life cannot be lived in isolation. You cut yourself off from the very means that God employs to provide His grace and comfort to you. That's why it's so important to be a member of a church of Jesus Christ so that you can access fully and freely the way of God in providing comfort and in ministering comfort to others. The Christian life is an interdependent life. We need one another. Paul had experienced this firsthand. He had both sent fellow Christians to provide comfort and received fellow Christians coming to him and received comfort from them. We see this in Colossians chapter 4, verse 8, when he tells the Colossians why he sent Tychicus to them. Verse 8 of Colossians 4 says, I've sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that you, he may encourage your hearts. He may comfort you. That's why he sent him, is that they might be comforted through him. In, in this very letter, in chapter 7, he describes how Titus showed up. Titus came from Corinth, met him in Macedonia, and Paul says, man, I was down. Fears within, pressures without. And God comforted me through Titus. Listen to the way he puts it. You might just want to look at 2 Corinthians 7, verses 5, 6, and 7. He puts it like this. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were afflicted at every turn, fighting without, fear within. Here's a man who's under pressure. He's afflicted. Verse 6, But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. Do you see this? There's a circle going on here. Paul had heard about the difficulties going on in Corinth. He was afflicted by that. So he writes a severe letter to them to call them to repent. He gives the letter to Titus. Titus goes to Corinth. Not sure how the Corinthians are going to respond. I mean, they're following false apostles. They're saying Paul's not really an apostle. Titus undoubtedly was afflicted going into that situation. That letter lands. The people read it. Many in the church repented. And Titus sees their repentance and he's encouraged by their repentance. He's comforted. So he goes back to Paul, meets him in Macedonia and says, I've got to tell you what happened. The people there in Corinth, many in the church have repented. I'm so encouraged by what happened. Paul now is encouraged by Titus' presence and the fact that Titus was encouraged by the Corinthians. Do you see what's going on here? There, there's just this organic distribution of comfort among the people of God. That's the way that God does it. One of the main methods that God uses to comfort His children is through personal contact, ministry, relationship with fellow believers. In fact, this text says one of the reasons that God comforts us in our afflictions is so that we'll be able to comfort others in their trials and afflictions as well. Have you ever thought of that? Some of you have undergone severe trials some of you are in the midst of severe trials now and in the midst of trials we look for comfort we want comfort and we we ask what's God doing what's God doing one thing God's doing is he is going to make you an instrument 
as He comforts you so that you can become a source, instrument of comfort <clears throat> to others. Have you ever thought about that? Why is this coming upon me? Maybe God is determined to bring affliction into your life, providing comfort in the midst of that affliction so that you can be an instrument to help comfort others who are going to be similarly afflicted. Isn't this what Paul says in verse 6? Look at it. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. And we need to get this really clear in our minds. The source of all comfort is Jesus Christ. What God's done for us in Christ. But the conduit, the relay stations of comfort are His people. The comfort comes from God. The transportation is provided by fellow believers. Christ comforts His people and He does it through personal relationships as we minister to one another out of what God has done in our own lives. What this means, brothers and sisters, is there's never any wasted pain in your life. God's always doing a thousand things. And not only is He determined to comfort you, He's determined to do it in a way that you become a steward of that comfort so that you can help others who are going to need the same kind of comfort in their own lives. Has God comforted you through some trial? Has God comforted you through divorce? Broken marriage? All the pain and hardship that that brings? Has, has He kept you standing, brought you through the other side? Well, you can minister that same comfort to others who are going to experience that sorrow and affliction. Has God comforted you through loss of a job? Loss of income? Have you seen God be faithful to you? You're not the only one who's going to lose a job. And, and what you've learned of God's comfort through your trial of job loss can become a source of encouragement to others who will live through that. Some of you have been comforted through loss of health. Some through death of a child. Death of a spouse. Can you say God has comforted me in the midst of the loss of my greatest love in life? Then experience the comfort of God, but experience it as a steward. And recognize there are others who need this. As God kept you standing, brought healing to you, comforted you through sexual abuse. This room is filled with people who are dealing with the pain and sorrow of sexual abuse. And some are so ashamed and embarrassed and frightened of it, they don't even know what to say. But this room is also filled with many whom God has comforted and helped through sexual abuse. And if we get this, then we'll be able to see the stewardship of providing comfort to others with the very comfort with which God has comforted us. Some of you have lived through, are living through the pain of a rebellious child, a disobedient son or daughter, a spouse that's been unfaithful. Do you know God's comfort? Then rejoice in that. But see it as a stewardship. And be aware and be on the lookout for ways to minister by your testimony, by your prayer, by your kind words, by your reminders that God is faithful even in what seems to be a completely impossible situation. Praise God for His comfort, but don't stop there. I guarantee you, no matter what affliction you've been through, what affliction you're in right now, you are not the first one to have experienced it. And you're not going to be the last one to experience it. And God who has comforted others will comfort you. And God who comforts you will use you to comfort others. Brothers and sisters, we have all been under siege with various kinds of trials in different ways. Let me simply remind you 
that in the midst of that, as God brings you to points of clarity, to renewal, to hope, He helps you to hang on because He's hanging on to you, and you work through this, and you live in the midst of it, recognize that it's not just for you. It's for others who need to be comforted as well. We cannot live this way. We cannot experience this kind of comfort, this kind of ministry of comfort if we don't get involved in the lives of one another. You can't live spiritually cocooned lives and taste this. It doesn't happen that way. One of the reasons that we meet in homes three times a month on Sunday nights is for this very purpose. I plead with you, whatever your schedule was, change it. To meet together with God's people in a home tonight to talk about this. Open yourself up. If this is foreign to you, if this is scary to you, and you don't even know how to move forward, just open yourself up. You're not alone. You're not the first one. You're not going to be the last one. God will minister His grace as He's promised to do. We need to see ourselves as instruments of comfort as well as objects of God's comfort. Because the God of all comfort always comforts all of His people in all of our affliction. I love the Heidelberg Catechism that came out of the 16th century when the Protestant Reformation was spreading throughout Europe. I love it because it's so centered upon Jesus Christ. The question and answer format keeps bringing us back to Christ. And I can't find anything probably in written human literature that surpasses the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism. Because in one sense, it summarizes everything that I've been trying to say this morning. So let me read it to you. Listen. If you're a child of God, listen and apply it to yourself. If you're not a child of God, you're not a disciple of Jesus, listen and pray that God would give you this by bringing you to faith in Christ. Here's the question. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Here's the answer. That I am not my own but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to Him, Christ by His Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. What comfort we have from the God of all comfort who gave up His Son for us in order to reconcile us to Himself. Brothers and sisters, look to Him. Go to Him. Do not settle for anything less than what the Apostle Paul says belongs to us through Christ. Let's pray. We thank You, O God, for Your great salvation, for the grace that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank You that He is our comfort in life and in death. And that because of what You've done for us in Him, we can know that You will comfort us in all of our afflictions. Help us to believe it to experience it for Jesus' sake. Amen.